Hello, and welcome to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I am your host, Mr. Miller. This podcast will cover a number of topics that happened on this date in history. Please visit the podcast webpage at thishappentoday.buzzsprout.com. There you can download the notes page, which will help you organize the information, as well as develop your own ideas on how these events change the world around us. If you're interested in hearing more, please consider subscribing so you will not miss out on what happens tomorrow in history. Today is August 6th. In the early morning hours of August 6, 1945, a B-29 bomber named Enola Gay took off from the island of Tinian and headed north by northwest toward Japan. The bomber's primary target was the city of Hiroshima, located on the deltas of southwestern Honshu Island, facing the Inland Sea. Hiroshima had a population civilians of almost 300,000, was an important military center containing about 43,000 soldiers. The bomber, piloted by the commander of the 509th Composite Group, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, flew to low altitude on automatic pilot before climbing to 31,000 feet as it neared the target area. At approximately 8.15 a.m. Hiroshima time, the Enola Gay released Little Boy, its 9,700-pound uranium gun-type bomb, over the city. Tibbetts immediately dove away to the avoid the anticipated shockwave. 43 seconds later, a huge explosion lit the morning sky as Little Boy detonated 1,900 feet above the city, directly over a parade field where soldiers of the 2nd Japanese Army were doing calisthenics. Though already 11 and a half miles away, the Enola Gay was rocked by the blast. At first, Tibbetts thought he was taking flak. After a second shockwave reflected from the ground hit the plane, the crew looked back at Hiroshima. The city was hidden by that awful cloud, boiling up, mushrooming, terrible and incredibly tall, Tibbetts recalled. The yield of the explosion was later estimated at 15 kilotons, the equivalent of 15,000 tons of TNT. On the ground, moments before the blast, it was calm, sunny Monday morning. An air raid alert from earlier that morning had been called off after a solitary aircraft was seen, the weather plane, and by 8.15 the city was alive with activity. Soldiers during their morning calisthenics, commuters on foot or on bicycles, groups of women and children working outside to clear fire breaks. Those closest to the explosion died instantly, their bodies charred black. Nearby birds burst into flames in midair, and dry combustible materials such as paper instantly ignited as far away as 6,400 feet from ground zero. The white light acted as a giant flash while burning the dark patterns of clothing onto skin and shadows of bodies onto walls. Survivors outdoors close to the blast generally described a literally blinding light combined with a sudden and overwhelming wave of heat. The effects of radiation are usually not immediately apparent. The blast wave followed the most instantly for those close in, often knocking them from their feet. Those that were indoors were usually spared the flash burns, but flying glass from broken windows filled most rooms and all but the very strongest structures collapsed. One boy was blown through the windows of his house and across the street as the house collapsed behind him. Within minutes, uh, 9 out of 10 people half a mile or less from ground zero were dead. People farther from the point of detonation experienced the first flash and heat, followed by seconds later by a deafening boom in the blast wave. Nearly every structure within one mile of ground zero was destroyed, and almost every building within three miles was damaged. Less than 10% of the buildings in the city survived without any damage, and the blast wave shattered glass in suburbs 12 miles away. The most common first reaction of those that were indoors, even miles away from ground zero, was that their building had just suffered a direct hit by a bomb. Small ad hoc rescue parties soon began to operate, but roughly half of the city's population was dead or injured. In those injured areas most seriously affected, virtually no one escaped serious injury. The numerous small fires that erupted simultaneously all around the city soon merged into one large firestorm, creating extremely strong winds that blew toward the center of the fire. The firestorm eventually engulfed 4.4 square miles of the city, killing anyone who had not escaped the first minutes after the attack. One post-war study of the victims of Hiroshima found that less than 4.5% of survivors suffered leg fractures. Such injuries were not uncommon, it was just that most who could not walk were engulfed by the firestorm. Even after the flames had subsided, relief from the outside was slow in coming. For hours after the attack, the Japanese government didn't even know what for sure had happened. Radio and telegraph communications with Hiroshima had suddenly ended at 8.16am and vague reports of some sort of large explosion had become to filter in. The Japanese High Command knew that no large-scale air raid had taken place over the city and that there were no large stores of explosives there. Eventually, a Japanese staff officer was dispatched by plane to survey the city from overhead. While he was nearly 100 miles away from the city, he began to report on a huge cloud of smoke that hung over it. 
The first confirmation of exactly what had happened came only 16 hours later with the announcement of the bombing by the United States. Relief, relief workers from outside the city began eventually to arrive, and the situation stabilized somewhat. Power in undamaged areas of the city was even restored on August 7th, with limited rail service resuming the following day. Several days after the blast, however, medical staff began to recognize the first symptoms of radiation sickness among the survivors. Soon the death rate actually began to climb again as patients who had appeared to be recovering began suffering from this strange new illness. Deaths from radiation sickness did not peak until three to four weeks after the attacks and did not taper off until seven to eight weeks after the attack. Long-range health dangers associated with radiation exposure, such as an increased danger of cancer, would linger for the rest of the victims' lives, as would the psychological effects of the attack. No one will ever know for certain how many people died as a result of the attack on Hiroshima. Some 70,000 70, people probably died as a result of the initial blast, heat, and radiation effects. This included about 20 American airmen being held as prisoners in the city. By the end of 1945, because of the lingering effects of the radioactive fallout and the after, other after effects, the Hiroshima death toll was probably over 100,000. The five-year death total may have even reached or exceeded 200,000 as cancer and other long-term effects took hold. At 11 a.m. on August 6th, Washington, D.C. time, radio stations began playing a prepared statement from President Truman informing the American public that the United States had dropped an entirely new type of bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima, an atomic bomb. Truman warned that if Japan still refused to surrender unconditionally as demanded in the Potsdam Declaration of July 26th, the United States would attack additional targets with equally devastating results. Two days later, on August 8th, the Soviet Union declared war in Japan and attacked Japanese forces in Manchuria, ending American hopes that the war would end before Russian entry into the Pacific Theater. By August 9th, American aircraft were showering leaflets all over Japan, informing its people that we are in possession of the most destructive explosive ever devised by man. A single one of our newly developed atomic bombs is actually the equivalent in explosive power to what 2,000 of our giant B-29s can carry on a single mission. This awful fact is one for you to ponder, and we solemnly assure you it is grimly accurate, or grimly accurate. We have just begun to use this weapon against your homeland. If you still have any doubt, make inquiry as to what happened to Hiroshima when just one atomic bomb fell in that city. Meanwhile, Tibbet's bomber group was simply waiting for the weather to clear in order to drop its next bomb. The plutonium implosion weapon, nicknamed Fat Man, was destined for the city of Nagasaki. And in 1971, Sir Che Blythe completed the journey, traveling west against the prevailing winds and arriving back in Hamble, Hampshire, 292 days later. He was the first man to sail solo around the world in the wrong direction and has led to a celebratory flotilla at the site of his historic achievement 50 years ago. The ex-paratrooper's feat later became known as the Impossible Voyage. The 81-year-old said that, he, that the anniversary celebrations were wonderful and he thanked those who greeted him. Sir Che from Hawick and the Scottish Borders used a 59-foot yacht, British Steel, to complete the challenge, which garnered international attention. The then Prime Minister, Edwin Heath, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Prince of Wales, and Princess Anne were among the 6,000 people to line the shore to welcome him back. Explaining the difficulty of the challenge, Sir Che said, The terrestrial spin of the globe makes sure that the winds all go in one direction and the sea goes in one direction. So you're up against the winds and the currents. Up until that moment in time, people had usually gone the classic route, pioneering aviator and solo sailor, sailor Sir Francis Churchester had previously said no one would be, ever be able to do it, prompting Sir Che's achievement to be described as the impossible voyage in the media. The accomplishment came two years after Sir Robin Knox Johnson became the first person to perform a single-handed, non-stop circumnavigation of the globe from west to east. Sir Robin was among the number of dignitaries to greet Sir Che on Friday morning. He said completing the challenge had been a great feat of British yachting. I think it's absolutely right to recognize Che's remarkable voyage 50 years ago and realize just how difficult it was, Sir Robin added. It took a further 23 years for anyone to match Sir Che's achievement, and he remains one of only five people to ever have completed the challenge. He was knighted for services to yachting in 1997. And then finally, in 1997, former Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer admitted that Microsoft was crazy to invest in Apple when the brand was on the brink of bankruptcy. 
The $150 million cash injection famously helped Apple come back from the brink of and blow past every tech competitor in its path to market domination, becoming the world's most valuable company. Ballmer was speaking on Bloomberg TV, where he was asked during an interview his thoughts on Apple, and while he commended the iPhone maker on its success, he made it clear Microsoft's deal to invest $150 million for shares of non-voting stock could have been its biggest mistake. They've done a great job. They're a company that's done a great job. If you go back to 1997 when Steve came back, when they were almost bankrupt, we made an investment in Apple as part of settling a lawsuit. We, Microsoft, made an investment. In a way, you could say that it might have been the craziest thing we ever did. But you know, they have taken the foundation of great innovation, some cash, and have turned it into the most valuable company in the world. The 1997 deal came within weeks of Apple facing bankruptcy and was announced as part of a broad patent cross-licensing agreement and a promise from Microsoft to provide its Office software to Macs in exchange for the Internet Explorer being the default browser on Apple's machines. In reality, it was a move to make Microsoft look competitive and not be penalized for monopolizing the market. For millennials who couldn't possibly comprehend a world where Apple didn't rule it, it was a period of PC boom and Microsoft was the big fish. Apple was worth less than $3 billion and lost more than $1.5 billion the year before Microsoft stepped in. While Microsoft thought the $150 million investment was a smart legal move to help a potential dead duck who posed no threat, they didn't count on the likes of Steve Jobs. By far the most best move Jobs ever made was striking this deal, which allowed Apple to keep the wolves from the door and create breathing space to nail down its flapping Mac business and transfer that success into the iPod. From here, Apple moved the strength from strength to strength with the creation of the iPhone and the iPad, which revolutionized personal computing habits and swept the leg out from under Microsoft, and the rest is history. Microsoft executives might want to look away now. Apple was worth less than $3 billion when it took Bill Gates' money, and now it's worth $700 billion on course to becoming a trillion-dollar company, something that eclipses Microsoft's relatively lowly $247 billion. Ballmer saying this is probably the craziest thing Microsoft ever did is somewhat of an understatement. Of course, had this been any other company, things would have worked out very differently, and we may have all been using Microsoft Zunes, but Steve Jobs' vision and the design of Joni Ivey deserve the credit for being instrumental in Apple's success. You have been listening to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I thank you for listening, and I hope that you have enjoyed learning about historical events from the past. Thank you to the following websites for their information regarding today's topics. The PeopleHistory.com, 1945 bombing of Hiroshima at osti.gov, 1971 Shape Life at www.bbc.com, and 1997 Microsoft buys stake in Apple computers at businessinsider.com. The music used as the background track for this podcast is Americana, created by Kevin McLeod on Incompetech.com. If you enjoyed this information and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing, as this will keep the historical events in your feed in the morning for each day. I hope you have a great day.